I, I'm going to demonstrate one of the least effective methods of teaching, which is to stand at a podium and click slides. Um, but uh, I think we can maybe provoke a few, a few thoughts. Um, and, and I ordinarily, when I talk about these things, I take some time to, uh, to introduce uh, some ideas to, to uh, try to encourage the group to think about the need for students to be pretty active participants in what they're learning and to convince them that when students just simply passively listen and then attempt to uh, repeat what they've heard on some kind of an exam, um, that, that that's not very effective. And since our time is, is fairly limited, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip past that and I'm going to make an assumption that you're already sort of buying into that idea. And uh, if you're not, we, we can, you know, take it outside afterwards and have a <laughs> chat about it. <laughs> and so I'm just going to skip through a bunch of slides that were intended to, to convince you of those things. And uh, um, uh, get, get to, to what we're supposed to, to chat about today. Um, and, and let me just say right at the onset, I've been involved for a number of years in uh, research not only in, in, in ways to engage students in the classroom and, and assess whether or not it's, it's effective, um, and also in uh, efforts to uh, try to disseminate ideas to, to others. And, and one of the things that I've learned, and I think this is an important caveat that you should also always take into consideration when you hear people talk about teaching methods and teaching ideas. Um, my experience is this. What works and what doesn't work is very much dependent on the personality and style of the, of the person, of the teacher, the instructor. And uh, there are clearly things that I can do and have demonstrable, wonderful success with, and somebody can watch that and, say, and get excited about it and say, that's a great idea, and they go and try it, and it's a complete flop. And, uh, and then I go in and I watch, I say, well, you're not doing it right, you've got to do this and this and this, and they try it and, and so forth. And sometimes it doesn't get any better. On the other hand, the person that sort of pays attention to these things and, and sees different ideas and so forth and says, you know, that, that's interesting. I wonder how that would work for me, and, and I'm not so sure about this and that, but I wonder if I tried this other thing and, 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 and tried that, if that might not work, and those kinds of experiences tend to be more successful. And so I, I, I hope that the discussion we have might be better at sort of provoking ideas and thinking in you rather than being sort of a demonstration of what works and what doesn't work. Now, it doesn't mean that no idea is, it doesn't mean that, that ideas are not portable. They are. But not every idea is equally portable for every pair of persons. That, that's my only point. And, and so you'll see some things that work for me, and they, they might work for you, and some of them won't. But there'll be other things that you'll think of that, that probably will work for you. And, and it, the interesting thing is I found that if instructors will simply think about what they're doing in the classroom, think about what they want the students to do, think about the outcomes that they're hoping for, and come up with a good way to assess whether those outcomes are being achieved, and then put their thinking cap on and try to create ways to engage the students so that those outcomes can be achieved, and if they will iterate with that and try some things and assess whether they're working or not, and those that are working, keep them, and those that aren't working, try something else. If people will just simply do that and iterate in that way, I have every hope in the world that they're going to be and become a great teacher. Um, and it turns out that what a professor thinks is going to work oftentimes will. You sort of will it to happen. You, you put your enthusiasm and your faith and your hopes behind something, and you find a way to charm the students into it, and it, oftentimes it's successful. The ones that I worry about are the ones that don't do anything. They just follow a, a, a pattern that they've had or that they saw and, 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 and focus all their attention on disseminating information in the nicest slides they can come up with and the most organized way they can think of. And if that's all they do, then, then their chances, their, their successes are much more limited. 
And so take, take some ideas and, and futz with them, and, uh, and, and, and you'll, you'll find successes. Uh, here's something that showed up just recently. I thought this was great. Um, things, three traits of good teachers this came from ABC Nightly News. Uh, I think it was directed towards um, public school teachers um, in K through 12, but it certainly applies to us. Number one, they make sure every student is keeping up. They change a lesson in midstream if it's not going well. In other words, they have real-time feedback as whether or not something's working, and they stop and change right there on the spot if necessary. And they have high standards. Uh, I, I thought that's three great, great statements. And uh, right th now, this semester, I'm teaching a class of nine students. And uh, it's, it's, it's students who uh, have a math disability, and my job is to teach them statistics and have them succeed in statistics, notwithstanding their, their math disability. And I've taught this course before, and, and there's a wonderful thing. We're able to keep every student up. Every student is able to success. Every student passes. They don't all become statisticians, that's for sure. But they, they develop a, a reasonable ability and expertise, and they succeed. And nine students is the most, this is the biggest class I've ever had, the biggest section I've ever had of this course. And so with six, five, four, eight, nine students, it's not that difficult to figure out how to do this because you've got every student right there. You know their names by the end of the first day of class, and you've got you're watching. You're watching every student, observing every student. And uh, in fact, you can even develop a nice sense of community. And, the, and the, the sort of the class sort of wills everyone to succeed. And the, and the group sort of takes ownership of each other. It's a wonderful dynamic. And so the question is, <laughs> right, I can do that with nine students or fewer. How do I do that with 90 or 200 or 900? I think 900 is our maximum without going to the Mary Center. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I guess that, that's the upper limit. Well, it's harder, right? It, you know it's harder when there's a group of, of, of students, a large group of students. So there, there definitely are some impediments and some challenges. Works great in this group of nine. The th part of the reason it works great, too, is not only do we have only nine students, but there's a really clear shared uh, objective. They all know that together we, we have difficulty in this particular subject, and our objective is to somehow succeed. And because that objective is so homogeneous and so well shared, it's easy for us to focus on it. It's easy to identify outcomes. The outcome is that at the end of the semester, you'll be able to do this, 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 and this, these, these statistical things. And, uh, and it's very easy to tell by doing exercises constantly in class, day after day, practicing different exercises to be able to tell whether students are getting it or not. When they're not, they're right there. They can speak and say, I don't get it, and we can stop, and we can figure it out. So how, what are the impediments for a big class? You know of some, right? What, what are some of the ones you could think of besides the size? Okay, there's the size. What else? Why else is it difficult? <coughs> Terry? That's right. Yeah, it's easy to hide. You can't hide when we're sitting around a, a conference table, nine people. There's no, no place to hide. What else? What else is an impediment? Think about the course that you teach or will teach. Why, why is this hard? We talked about assessing things as you're going on the, on the fly. And with you know, a classroom of 90 students, it's really hard to get a sense. You know, Maybe these people are understanding, but these people are not. Like who's understanding, who's not? And it's hard to gauge that for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely a challenge. Anything else comes to mind? Yeah. Trav? Grading all their work. Yeah. Some of the things that you can do with those nine, you're getting them seeing what they're doing and you're looking at their work and you're giving them feedback. Yeah, I'm walking around behind the table. They're sit, they sit around a round table, and I'm walking around behind looking at their computers as they go and say, uh-uh, that's not, 
what you want to do. So a you know, very different dynamic in an auditorium. You can't walk around between the rows and peek at what they're doing. I think that would be an interesting adventure if we could, because my guess is that many of them probably aren't on task, are they? Helping them, another impediment is helping them understand that you care about them when there are a lot. Easy in the group of nine. I mean, they know it by the end of the first day. It's not so in the, in the big class. Those are all, here's some other ones that I came up with class size. Content. This is, nobody mentioned this, but this is a, a big thing because um, when you're trying to do things in the classroom that involve the students, it takes time, especially if you want to take time to stop and say, wait, you're not getting it, are you? We better do this instead to help you get it. In the meantime, 10 other things that you had on your list that they were supposed to get that day go by the wayside. Uh, the students have different expectations. That was the other thing in my little class. They all expect the same thing. That's not true in your big class. That was kind of brought up there by Terry. Um, and uh, the other thing that's an interesting impediment, there are things that experts on education will tell you that you can do, but a lot of faculty members say, oh, I, I don't have time to implement that. When, when am I going to do that? I'm trying to do my research, trying to get publications. I'm trying to... Uh, just figure out what it is we're talking about tomorrow, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's too much to suddenly change what I do in the classroom with them. Preparation time related, I don't even know how to do it, um, and my colleagues will not give me tenure if I do, right? I mean, those, those are the, the kinds of things. The other thing that's kind of an interesting, this is a little more subtle maybe, but uh, one of the things that does not happen in my group of nine, they're not in competition. They all want each other to succeed, and they cheer each other on. That's not always true in a class. Uh, and, and competition, I, I, we're seeing a little more uh, activity with that in some of the literature. Um, th this, is, this is an issue. Uh, students, students compete with each other. They, they don't uh, want to share sometimes, and uh, they think they, some, you'll get some students who think the others are all parasites and others who are too shy to get help, and it, it becomes socially a, a problem. So uh, I, I wanted to skip past class size because I just, we, we've talked about that enough. Um, content coverage. This, this is a big issue. When I've had the chance to chat with people at other universities, this, this is a big one. Um, you know, I noticed Clint here from biology. Uh, There's somebody else from one of the life sciences I thought I saw. Uh, the person who's not here, you know. It's because he's trying to prepare for his class. He's got to do <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't know all of your disciplines as well as I know biology, but, you know, every year there's 10% more. And the publishers keep printing fatter textbooks as though you're supposed to talk faster, right, <laughs> to somehow get it all in. And, and oftentimes, especially... At an early stage in one's career, one sort of uses the textbook as the guide for what we should cover. And that, that's a pretty natural thing to do, but it, it's really problematic when the textbooks just keep getting bigger. And the textbooks don't get bigger because experts have said, this needs to be included. Textbooks get bigger because publishers are trying to sell to as many people as they can, and rather than picking and choosing, they just include what everybody wants, and people want different things, and so that's why they get fatter. And so not a very rational choice for what happens in, in the classroom. So here's a few guidelines on, on choosing on the content and dealing with the content issue because if you don't deal with it, um, you're, you're going to have frustrations and problems all the time. First off, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. You'll never get it right. You'll always think, oh, it was too much this semester. Oh, it wasn't enough. So you'll always have to be asking the question. Um, so here's some important questions to consider. At the end of my course, how much are they going to remember? And I don't re mean remember for the final exam. I, rem I mean remember five years from now. How much are they really going to remember? And if the answer is, well, they won't remember much because I could cover so much, then you have to ask yourself, what's the point of covering all of this if they're not going to remember it? You know, Well, they'll learn it again in another class. Well, is that really the, the way we want to do it? Um, so is it worth taking class time to explain things they won't remember? 
the better question, I think, is this one. Looking at the list, what things on this list, if, if the students really truly understood them, if they understood these ten things or whatever it is, would it empower them to have access and understand the rest by simply reading about it or, or looking it up in some way? Um, we, it's not difficult for us to come up with sort of a hierarchy of what's important, most important, what's foundational. It's difficult for the students. And students, there's two things that happen with students. Number one, if there's a whole list, list of things that we cover, they see it as flat. They do not naturally pick out the hierarchy of the information. Even in a well-written textbook chapter that's got, you know, the headings, is, it's outlined things very carefully to point out the hierarchy, and there's the little section at the beginning that sort of gives them the big picture. It does not happen for most of the students. In fact, what happens is they skip past the big picture part or whatever and get to the stuff that they have to have, you know, to pass the test. And, uh, and, and so they, they do not do this for themselves very well. It's a, it's a healthy thing for us to help them learn to do. Russ? So this could include skills that you give them that could give them access so they could learn other things. I mean, these are Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that, that's, that's very much the case. And so when you start thinking about how can I empower my students to have access to biology, I'll just pick on biology because same discipline. Um, goodness. Biology exists here on campus. We're standing on top of it right now. It's on the second floor. <laughs> All of biology is there. And if it's not there, it's certainly on the Internet. So we don't have to give them biology. They already have it. The problem is they do not know how to open the door and open the book and get to it. They have no access to it. And so if we start thinking about how do I empower them, if I think about how many things I have to look up, um, the other question is this, why do we keep making the decision that the classroom is the place to deliver the content? Um, there's a little thing that we do sometimes with faculty members in a workshop or whatever. We ask them to calculate the cost of an hour of class. And so you start saying, well, you know, it's cheap now because we don't have to pay to make slides, we just bring in the PowerPoint. Well, what's an hour of your time cost? Okay, what's an hour of the utilities, uh, the overhead? I've got a class of 200 students. They would make $8 an hour. So, you know, I'm into it for $1,600 already right there. You start going through the different things, and what about the time, the preparation time that I put into this, and all those kinds of things. You'll, you'll find that for one of your classes that maybe has a few hundred students in it, the, the, the hour costs 5000 bucks or something like this. It's a lot of money for an hour. I always like to think about that because it makes me wonder, what am I doing that's worth 5000 bucks? Better yet, what are the students doing that's worth 5000 bucks? If the answer is seeing they're falling asleep, <laughs> they can do that for less. <laughs> right? <laughs> You <laughs> do that in the library. <laughs> and, uh, and if all I've got to offer is me standing there talking at them, why not do what we're doing right here? Let's film it and transmit it. They can watch it on their own time. And in fact, they can even turn it up to like 2x speed. <laughs> they actually do this. I've watched my son do this. And, and it's really fascinating to watch a person, you know, you see how much you move and so forth as you're talking. <laughs> and and so, so is the classroom really the best place to deliver content? Um, so what you want to think about then is how much content, which content, what do we do to empower the students to have access to the content, and can we have the content delivered to them outside of the classroom so that when we come to the classroom, 
we do something that requires 201 people to be together. Um, so, very simple suggestion. Find ways to get them to read the chapter before they come to class. It's a tried and true method. It's hard. They will resist. But if you can spend significant effort right up front in the course, getting them to read before they come, and if the things you do in the classroom depend on them having done that reading and cause them to see the value of having done the reading, then you'll have success. I will tell you this. The first day, I know this from sad experience, the first day that you stand and repeat what was in the book will be the last day they'll read before they come to class. And so you have to actually force yourself to honor that commitment yourself that they come to class prepared. And if they don't, they're going to discover that that wasn't such a good thing after all. And you kind of have to be willing to, to, to stick to that. My experience is that they're more pliable at the beginning of the semester, and you can usually talk them into doing things more then. And so that first week or so is your chance to show that what we're going to do really is, is worth doing and, and to convince them to continue with it. Um, something in terms of student expectations. It's easy to blame the students when the learning isn't going well. It's easy to blame them that, well, they don't like to read before they come to class. Uh, it's easy to blame them that uh, they, they, don't want to, uh, they don't want to study and work hard. And um, in recent years, about the last five or ten years, I've come to the conclusion that I've been wrong all this time. I've come to realize that the students really do want to learn, for the most part. The group really does want to learn, especially at the beginning of the semester. And uh, they really are willing to play along with and do the things that uh, you encourage them to do uh, if, they, if they have the sense that this will, will help their learning. I can remember very clearly one day when uh, we did something, we did an exercise in class, and uh, they uh, they 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 failed miserably at it, and I was so frustrated with them because it was obvious, obvious, that the entire class collectively had not done the reading that I asked them to do. And here we were wasting everybody's time doing an exercise that they couldn't succeed at because they hadn't done the reading. And so I, I, uh, I lost it. <laughs> I s came down on them and I said, you know, you're wasting your time, you're wasting my time, this just isn't right. I've asked you to do this and you're not. And somebody sheepishly raised his hand and said, Dr. Bell, we're not lazy. We did the reading. We didn't get it. We didn't understand. And... Uh, it had a huge impact on me, and I said, okay, so, so talk about that. So they talked about it for a few minutes, and it became obvious within two or three minutes that what they didn't understand was the purpose of the chapter they were supposed to read. They didn't see where it fit in. That was the problem. And even though, you know, the first words off the author's pens are, the purpose of this chapter is... Um, I, I swear, they, they skip past that stuff to get to the meat. And I said, okay, well, the purpose of the chapter, it was, this was the point that the author was trying to make. And I took like two minutes, drew a little diagram on the board, and said, this is what the point was. And there was this big collective, oh. And so I said, um, what if the last two minutes every Friday, they had to, in that class they had to read over the weekend. I said, well, if the last two minutes every Friday... I just took two minutes at the board and gave you an overview of what the big idea of the next chapter is. And so I did that. It made all the difference in the world. It made all the difference in the world. And so I was totally wrong about their attitude. I was totally wrong about what they were doing. All I knew is that they weren't able to do what I wanted them to do. 
and it turned out that I needed their feedback. I would have never guessed this on my own. I had no idea. Fortunately, the one brave student came forward with what the problem was, and we made the change, and it, and it, made a, it had a huge impact on their learning. So I could have just given up and said, well, okay, you're not getting it from the book, so I'm going to have to stand here and tell you what. That would not have been the right move. The, the right move was informed by, uh, by what was going on in their minds. Um, remember, though, they're not all going to be universally pleased. They're not universally motivated, and, and you just have to live with that. So I uh, don't have very much time, but I want to just share four ideas with you, if that's okay of things that can be done that uh, have, I've got good evidence that these improve learning and uh, they get the students involved and every one of these has been tried and tested in classes of 200 or more students and they're all, they all work. Um, with the caveat that our personalities differ and different things work better for, for different instructors. These are the names of the four ideas. Uh, short in-class peer involvement, EQ, uh, the one I call the power of the paragraph, and uh, formative assessment. These are, these are things that you can do. And uh, they can be done in formal ways. They can be done in informal ways. I'll, uh, I'll just share some kind of formal structural ways that they can be used, but you can find informal ways of using them as well. In-class peer involvement. Uh, it's a very simple idea. A lot of people use this and uh, definitely portable and uh, scalable regardless of the size of your class. So let's suppose that you did convince them to read the chapter before they came to class. So this is what happens in, say, a generic course. The students read the chapter, they come, and a lecture happens for 50 minutes. Something that you could start tomorrow, well, Monday, is just take the same lecture that you were going to give and just break it up. After 10 minutes, take three or four, and then you got the next 10 minutes, and then three or four, and then the next 10 minutes, and three or four, and so forth. So the question is, what happens during those green moments? Well, what you do is this. You instruct the class to, to identify a person sitting next to them, to be their partner, okay? And so we're going to ask you to do that, all right? So we've got partners here. Richard, would you go be Jane's partner? <laughs> and it's going to have to be a group of three over here, all right? And what you do is uh, you simply... Uh, take some time and you ask the students to simply explain back to each other what you've been talking about for the last 10 minutes. That's all it is. They'll appreciate the time because they're probably having a hard time keeping up. And they'll have questions like, do you know what he's talking about? <laughs> and so it's opportunity for them to simply process. So you just explain to them, it's time for the two of you to take time uh, processing what we've been doing for the last 10 minutes, okay? And so that's what you do. We're going to just demonstrate for a little bit. So uh, you've got two seconds to decide which of you is person A and which of you is person B. I guess we have to have a C over there. Okay, so decide right now. Okay, good. You're decided. You know, and at this point, you have to hold them accountable. So will all the A's please raise their hand? Okay, good. I'm assuming the others are Bs. All right, now, all the Bs right now take one minute to explain to the A's the concept that I have been trying to convey about small uh, peer, in class peer involvement. Go. So,
Okay, I'm going to cut you off. That wasn't a whole minute. One thing that you'll learn, by the way, when you first start doing this, is you'll discover that when you're standing up there in front of the class and they're talking, a minute is a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. You're very much used to just, you know, I can talk and 20 minutes go by before I even blink. But uh, when they're talking and you're not saying anything, it'll feel a little uncomfortable the first time. Uh, I cut it short because we don't have a lot of time. So that's the first step. Next step, now the A's explain it back to the B's in different words. Go. Okay, we'll stop. How long do you think that was, by the way? It was 30 seconds. That was 30 seconds. It's actually a fair amount of time for students to kind of work with, and you can kind of listen to the group. You'll hear this get louder, and you'll hear it start to peak and get a little bit softer. That's the time to, to cut them off when they maybe were wishing that there was just a little bit more time for this um, rather than where they have deviated. Now they're talking about what they're going to do Friday night and so forth. Um, so you do have to kind of keep them on task. So, so that's good. That sounds pretty good. And it's nice. It breaks up the lecture. And then when you're ready to go for the next 10 minutes, you got their attention back. An adult's attention span is only around 10 to 15 minutes. This is widely demonstrated. So, you know, they need, they need that opportunity. Now, um, we, would, we won't do this, but what we would now do is, if this were probably a more challenging concept than the one you had, there might have been some differences in what you said. You weren't quite sure. And so we would now ask you to take time to negotiate. By the way, there was an article published in Science Magazine about a year ago that showed some very interesting data where this kind of thing was, was being done in the classroom. And it was a science class. And what they found was that even if two students were talking to each other and neither of them understood the concept, this was interesting. At the end of the conversation, they both understood it better. Because as they heard themselves and each other saying it, they're thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. But they probably don't misunderstand the same things. And so they're able to kind of put together a collage of ideas that, that tends, tends to move more toward what, what's correct. Plus, they're sitting there. They've got their notes. They've got this so forth. And oftentimes what happens is pretty soon they notice that the conversation to the right of them seems to be going better than theirs is. And so pretty soon that twosome becomes a foursome and they start... They start worth you. The other thing I do, of course, is I, is I uh, have TAs that are wandering around the room monitoring these conversations and uh, saying you know, to somebody, you know, I don't think it's in the newspaper. You can put that down. Sounds like you, looks like you probably understand it, so why don't you explain it back to me? And then you know, it starts to provoke more, more dialogue and, and more understanding. So we would take time to process and repair each other's understanding. At this point, I would ask, I, the great Oz, say, do you understand? Uh, in-class peer involvement. Okay, and that's about the response you ordinarily get. <laughs> kind of, you know, and at this, at this point we might say, does anyone have a question? And usually what happens is nobody's got a question. They understand it perfectly, so we say, great, and we go on. Rookie mistake. You don't say, do you understand? Watch the heads not. Ask if there's any questions. Nobody has one. Maybe one person does. There's always one or two, but usually nobody does. And then say, wonderful, and move on. At this point, you say, let's find out. Let's see if you really do. Will you please answer the following questions individually on a piece of paper and write down your answers? Or now it's time to get out the clickers or any, whatever tool we're going to find out we're going to use to get them to, to solve a problem right here on the spot that they'll only be able to solve successfully if they understand the concept. 
So we spent two and a half, three minutes processing it. We're going to spend another minute or two doing what I think is the most important thing we're going to do today. We're going to find out right here if they truly understand. And we tell them, look, we're not here to record what we want to learn later. We're here to learn it right here in the classroom. You got exposed to it in your textbook. Here we're going to learn it. And so we try the problem. And uh, so, so, you know, I don't know. I made this up. It's a little hard because this, the concept we're talking about here is a fairly simple one. But if this were in biology, you know, there'd be a problem. There'd be some pro or a math class or, or uh, some kind of a, uh, an analysis we're doing on a piece of literature. Whatever it would be, they would have to perform now. And you want this to have high expectations. You want it to be challenging, doable if they truly understand, but challenging and maybe insurmountable if they truly do not understand. Because what you want them to discover is that, oh, I don't get it after all. And so uh, when you do this and then you, you say, OK, what's your answer? And we did the clickers or we raised our hands or whatever. And we say, OK, here's the correct answer. And there's this moment of near panic in the classroom. Oh, no. Now when you say, are there any questions, all the hands go up. They don't like thinking they can do it and then finding out that they can't. And they want to know right now why I can't do this. And, uh, you know, there'll be some that don't care, but most of the students will care very much. And this is the learning moment. Uh, be better off cutting the lecture five minutes shorter and having five more minutes of this than, than otherwise. Um, our time's up uh, nearly, uh, so I don't have time to elaborate much on the other suggestions. But we can email some slides to you if you like. Uh, EQ is a similar kind of exercise. It stands for elaborative questioning. But uh, we usually use it as an outside of class exercise where they have to uh, get with a partner and they have to spend like half an hour teaching them the concept from class that day. Um, and uh, then we ask them to uh, ask questions of each other that require that, you know, that begin with words like how and why that require elaboration. And hold them accountable for this and grade them on this. Um, one study, a, a student, a PhD student from the IPT department um, studied a course that we were involved with. We were, we were initiating this. And uh, among a variety of pedagogies that we used, she found that this one was the one that most correlated with success in the course. The quality of this experience correlated with, with how they did on the, on the final exam. And so um, that, that, that was data that we considered useful uh, to encourage students in subsequent semesters to take this very seriously. Um, the other thing is to have them write a paragraph. Uh, I use this as a major form of assessment when I teach Biology 100. We give them prompts, and they have to go home and write a paragraph and it has to be a good paragraph. It has to be a paragraph that belongs in a textbook teaching, uh, teaching the subject. And you can see that's a pretty extensive prompt. Um, and we do give them the rubric that we're going to use to score it. We give them the rubric. And, uh, and we grade these. Sometimes we team it up. In some class, we team it up with the EQ assignment so that they have to, uh, after they do the EQ, then they have to, to write the paragraph. Writing turns out to be such an important way. They write to learn, and they also write to demonstrate whether they have learned. And uh, students report that this exercise helps them tremendously because even though they thought they understood the concept, when they have to write about it, and when they get the feedback from a TA or from the faculty member that this doesn't make any sense, you have to go back and rework it until it does. That becomes a process of learning. And so when we do this, we, get, we place a lot of emphasis on front-loading the feedback. In other words, bring the paragraph to us now. And the better students will iterate these things six or seven times. At the end of the exercise, they're like, man, I've never had to write a paragraph like this before. I've never had to spend this much time writing a single paragraph. And uh, you know, we think that blesses their lives in other ways beyond the, the science class. And so. Um, the wonderful thing is, is that this takes two minutes to grade it. It's easy to grade. You know, TAs in, in an hour can grade 20, 25 of these. So, you know, if you've got six TAs for your big class, you can go through these quickly. 
but the students spend hours doing them. That's what you want. You want exercises that take students hours to do and <clears throat> provides lots of learning, and it takes the faculty member two minutes to grade. That's the kinds of things, and that's the wonderful, that's what I call that the power of the paragraph. Um, giving them the rubric turns out to be huge. And we discovered, by the way, this semester that you can, if you have the TAs record in, uh, I think I've got some instructions for doing that. If you have the TAs record, we use Google Docs, in a, in a spreadsheet, um, you have your rubric, and they, re, and they answer with a yes or a no or a sometimes, so it's just simple. Either they did or they didn't or kind of did. And then just write a few comments in the last column. You can use the mail merge feature of Word uh, to take this whole table, send the students all an individual email, and now it's got written comments because it writes down the rubric question. It writes down yes or no or sometimes next to it. And then, then all the comments of the students, they get these emails and they think that you have sat there and written by hand to every one of them personally from the instructor and they think it's, it's wonderful. You know, I got written feedback on my paper. It's FERPA approved. <laughs> you can do this. It's allowed. The other thing is to spend time uh, realizing, just, just say one last word on this. We could go into detail on this, and there's a lot of data we've gathered on how this works and ways that we can make it work. It's a conversation for another day. And uh, like I said, I, I can work with whoever's in charge, Jane or, or, uh, or, or Lynn or somebody, to, to get you slides if you want them. But uh, one of the things that I've started doing in, in classes that I teach that have an exam is that I don't have midterms. Um, we have the final exam. That's your grade. Find out at the end if you if you're, if you're got it. The metaphor I like to use for them is that uh, nobody in the process of making a cake opens up the oven when the cake is half-baked and criticizes it for not being done yet. We wait till the end. And then we look at the cake and see how good it is. Um, and so I, I say, look, the final exam is where we find out what you did. The journey, you're all going to take different trajectories, but we've got to give you milestones along the way. And so we're not going to have midterms. We're going to have instead a small exam every Friday, every week. And we're going to, not only that, after, you, you, it's, it, it will be great. It will be scored. But we'll spend half of class time doing it and the rest of half, of half of class giving you feedback on how you did and why this problem is this way or that, this problem is that way. Do that every Friday. And what I do to take the fear out of it for them, because they're all afraid, you know, the whole thing depends on the final exam. What am I going to do? They want incremental scores so that they have a little more control. What I do is I say, look, we'll record the scores on these Friday assessments. We don't call them exams, we call them assessments. We record the scores. And uh, if, you know, if, if the scores on those assessments are, are good and, and they contribute in a positive way to your grade, if they're higher than they are in your final exam score, we'll, we'll split the difference. We'll make it half final exam and half these assessments. We don't have a problem doing that. But watch and see what happens. And so they're all like, okay, that's fine. You know, if the final exam is higher, we'll give you that score. You can guess what happens. First third of the semester, the average score on these Friday assessments is like a D. And so now they're feeling a little bit nervous. They're hoping for improvements, and now the final exam is starting to seem more important. And so I'll say something like, look, look, we'll take, we'll take half of those Friday assessments, and if your score on half of them average the best half, the best, not, you know, they'll take the top five scores, average that. We'll compare that to the final exam. Okay, you feel better now? Fine. Keep going. Every Friday is my chance to try to do better. They're still getting C's and so forth. Get to the final exam, guess what? The final exam is their highest score. And, and it's very, very effective that way. You know, it's not going to be universally true, but what we have found is that when we make adjustments based on how they did on these, you know, to boost their grade, it, it makes an average difference of like a third of a grade. They, they really have very little impact. Um, but what you do is you keep the student coming back every week saying, okay, this time I can get it right. And then what you do is, is after the exam, you're like, dang, another D. You say, okay, well, look, what are you going to do during the coming week so that by next Friday you know how to do the things? I see that problems number three, five, and seven really cause you problems. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will have problems three, five, and seven again, 
course, it would be a different problem, but the same type of problem on the next assessment. So you can come back and try it again. And uh, what I do is just every one of those Friday assessments is comprehensive. Not exhaustive, because you run out of time, but comprehensive. And so constantly, they're reinforcing the concepts as they go and having to solve the problems again and again. And the ones that are more difficult, they appear more frequently. And then by the time we get to the final exam, they know how to do it. And so um, whereas the averages were Ds, they truly are. For most of those assessments, the average on the final exam tends to be uh, B, you know, something in the Bs. This is a great thing. And the thing that's so great about it is you're using grades and assessment to motivate learning. You're not using assessment to just spread people out on grades. You're using this whole experience is to help motivate them to mastery. That I is the idea. That one thing, if that could be used in more classes at BYU, we would see more learning occur. But this is not a common way to use assessment at BYU or any other institution of higher ed. Well, I've got examples of how we do it and so forth in here, but let me just show you one last slide that maybe will, will convince you. This is four semesters in which we did things the traditional way. That's the scores on the final exam for those four semesters. And you can see it's pretty, pretty uh, consistent. What does that score, 1.5? What does that mean? Uh, it's a standard score. Okay. Uh, I, I don't even remember how we calculate. Okay. This is the three semesters of implementation thereafter. Um, it took, you can see the first one started out about 1.5. The first semester, their performance didn't improve. We had to learn how to do this. But over the three semesters that we learned how to do it, the scores improved, and they stayed up here thereafter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, from, here, from here to here, that's a 40% increase in performance. Mm -hmm. In educational literature, that's huge. huge. That's a huge change. Um, so we, we certainly learned that this was an important thing for them to do. The other thing that's nice is it preserves their attitudes all the way to the end of the course. They're still trying. They don't give up part way for the most part. You know, they say, well, okay, there's always another game. There's always another chance. And, and so that, that works well. And, you know, those Friday assessments may or may not contribute to their grade, but they do contribute heavily to their motivation. So anyway, I know I've taken too much time and probably talked way too fast, but those are a few suggestions. And if you've got questions or whatever, you're certainly welcome to ask or contact me. If you want copies of the slides, just email me and I'll send them to you. That's probably the easiest way. So I just got the traditional BYU email address and happy to share anything, any materials. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, you're welcome.